Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I recently attended the 2016 Nutrition and Medicine Conference hosted by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and um, which I highly recommend. If you've never been to that program, it, it takes place every summer at the end of July. We help to sponsor it here at Wellness Form Health and I always learn a lot of good stuff and, and um, it's a great opportunity to meet a lot of like-minded people. I think there were close to 800 people at this conference. So anyway, the Friday night program was about athletics and sports nutrition and it featured several presenters, one of whom was Dr. James Loomis, who is the medical director of the Barnard Medical Center. And he stated during his presentation that there's no special diet for athletes. They just need to eat more calories and that increased calorie intake will increase their protein intake enough to fuel athletic performance. So um, I thought it was a really well done presentation on the fact that there isn't an athletic diet. There's just a good diet. Athletes eat more of that good diet. Another speaker who I enjoyed hearing for the first time was Rich Roll, the ultra Iron, Ironman champion. And he told his story about how he recovered from drug and alcohol addiction, and then um, you know, he ate a terrible diet, showed some pictures of himself sort of as a, um, you know, in his 30s, not looking so good, out of shape, and all that sort of thing, like a lot of us did back then, myself included. And, um, and he started, uh, he was able to, you know, remake himself into a really successful endurance athlete, uh, eating a plant-based diet, just doing what Dr. Limbus was talking about, just eating a high higher calorie plant-based diet. He didn't need to protein load and all that sort of thing. And so what was interesting about this whole experience is the audience was filled with people who were pretty knowledgeable about plant-based nutrition or interested in it for the most part or they wouldn't have been there. And yet most of the questions were about protein. At the end of all the presentations and the talks and the whole nine yards, there was a Q&A and a and a panel discussion with all the presenters. And a lot of the questions were about protein. And Rich Roll made the comment that the fact that an educated group such as this still has so many questions about the protein issue tells you how ingrained our reverence for protein really, really is. More and more studies, um, however, are refuting the protein myth, including a recent one that was conducted to see how a branched amino acid and, and uh, carbohydrate supplement compared to a carbohydrate only sports drink and affecting markers of muscle damage and performance. And basically it showed no difference at all for the addition of branched chain amino acids. 30 healthy and resistance trained males were enrolled in the study. Baseline data were gathered. The participants performed 10 sets of five repetitions at 80% of their maximum barbell back squat intensity for three consecutive days, and then randomly assigned to consume one of two commercial products in 600 milliliters of tap water right after the exercise. One product was the combination product of a branch chain amino acids made by Muscle Farm. The Muscle Farm product, by the way, was mostly amino acids, tiny bit of carbohydrate. The other was um, uh, Powerade with 42 grams of carbohydrate, 168 calories, no added amino acids. Bottom line, added amino acids didn't improve anything they measured, including muscle soreness, recovery, strengthen, subsequent workouts, etc. And other studies have shown the same thing. The addition of amino acid supplements doesn't lead to better performance. One concluded, and I'll read this to you, dietary assessments of athletes strongly suggest that any benefit of the supplement, the amino acid supplement they're referring to, comes from helping athletes meet their caloric needs rather than independently supporting a larger muscle mass. Most athletes would find it easier, cheaper, and safer to eat more food to obtain the needed calories than to take protein or amino acid supplements. That's exactly what Dr. Loomis was saying during his presentation. Still another study showed the same thing, only this one was even a little bit more dramatic. Athletes were assigned to two diets, with one um, having 17% of calories from protein, the other having 35% of calories from protein, and the athletes eating over twice as much protein did not lose more weight or build a single extra pound of muscle mass than the athletes eating less than half as much. So all of this evidence is showing that muscle is not built in the kitchen. It is built through training. And I think, again, Dr. Loomis is right in saying that there is no special sports nutrition diet. There's just a really good diet for humans, and athletes need a lot more calories to fuel their performance. And that brings with it additional protein, but as a percentage of calories, it remains about the same. And by the way, um, 
I had an intern here for quite some time earlier this year, and we'll, we'll come out with some more information on this protein and sports performance issue, but she researched the issue quite thoroughly and found that um, athletic performance is fueled by calorie intake, not protein loading, study after study after study after study showing the same thing. So we archive quite a few of those studies on our server, and we'll have more to, about, more to say about that in uh, coming video clips. All right, so I'm really excited to talk about this uh, issue. According to a new article, current nutrition research is plagued by reductionism. I thought about Dr. Colin Campbell, the author of Whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition, when I read this. And um, according to these researchers, the reductionism is the reason we're making little progress in addressing obesity and other degenerative diseases with today's nutritional approaches. The authors of the article state that in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, the discovery of vitamins and minerals in food helped in the prevention and treatment of conditions like scurvy and beriberi and rickets. And as a result, research focused on the premise that there's a cause and effect relationship between specific diseases and individual nutrients. Nutrient deficiencies could be explained by the role that a particular nutrient played in the development of disease, and providing particular nutrients in the diet could prevent and reverse disease. And that was, of course, the case with conditions like scurvy and beriberi. The authors refer to this as the single nutrient model of research. But in the second half of the 20th century, new re nutrition research did not make similar progress. And the reason is that that the framework for research remained the same, lodged in that individual nutrients with very specific effects on health, instead, and, and it's just irrelevant for today's diseases. And, and I think what happened is that we went from, a, from, from um, a situation where many people in the world really experienced diseases of deficiency to a place where now most people in the world are experiencing diseases of excess. In spite of that, however, the search for individual nutrients responsible for those diseases continued. And so by way of example, Ansel Keys focused on fat as the cause of disease, and he was partially right about that, although it wasn't just fat in the diet. On the other hand, British nutritionist John Yudkin argued that carbohydrate was the culprit in disease. And this and other similar arguments about individual nutrients, that's still going on today. And it doesn't really lead anywhere because nobody is going to solve all of their problems by just eating low fat. Beer is low fat, but I don't think consuming a lot of it. You can eat low fat cookies. I mean, that's not the only thing. And, and um, uh, so the, the search for single nutrients doesn't really help us very much. The article goes on to say that nutrition research currently suffers from a boundaries problem, meaning that certain paradigms restrict research and the exchange of ideas and theories. Um, and that's certainly true. I mean, if you want to get funding, then you have to apply for grants doing research within the current paradigms that everybody's working within. The research community remains focused on reductionist science and the search for nutritional heroes and villains to solve our current epidemic and disease. Instead, the authors argue we should take into account the fact that nutrients in foods interact in complex ways that cannot be explained by their individual nutrient parts. Now you can understand why I was thinking of Dr. Campbell's work and his book Whole as I was reading this article. They say that it's time for nutrients to take a back seat to the study of dietary patterns as the primary focus, which they call the food synergy paradigm. Now, there are a lot of barriers with, uh, to, to this happening, which get discussed in the article. The authors point out that we have a problem with the quality of data used, used in nutrition research, and that nutrition research has deviated from good science practice due to economics and politics, and those are the barriers to making progress. Commercial interests exploit all the uncertainty while we're looking for nutritional heroes and villains, and um, uh, and all this stuff that's done by reductionist research to sell supplements, fortified foods, and diet programs. Um, the researchers say the health halo and robust sales for products that are labeled low fat, or um, I see in the grocery store things like chocolate candies fortified by calcium, you know, calcium builds strong bones. What that does is it gives more incentive to do more reductionist research to develop more products to capitalize on more inaccurate information. According to these authors, it's time to adopt what they call a nutritional ecology approach to nutrition research, which is defined as a framework that assumes that health and disease 
are due to the interactions with humans, of humans with their environment and that these interactions play out over very long periods of time. And with this approach, the assumptions change to reflect that many nutrients are needed for health and that each interacts with the other. Furthermore, nutrient requirements change frequently due to circumstances like age, reproductive status, and physical activity. They also stress that it's time to recognize that both nutritional deficiency and nutritional excess contribute to disease. And I think that there's not much recognition in nutrition today that nutritional excess, people understand that the calories, nutritional excess in the form of calories contribute to disease, but I don't think they understand too much protein, too much fat, too much of everything is contributing to disease. Now, at the end of the article, it was all great until the very end, and then the authors include this complicated matrix that tried to reflect the nutritional geometry, uh, modeling how nutrients interact with one another, and I, I could have lived with all, without all of that. And I think that they were trying to just come up with something that would show how this would all happen. But I really think the bigger point which is the need to stop focusing on single nutrients and focus on dietary patterns, uh, which are really what contribute to disease and obesity was spot on. So um, all in all, very good article uh, in, in terms of where nutritional research should be going. Now the things that inhibit this from happening, you've got politics, economics, who's going to fund studies like this, and then you've got the difficulty in following, you know, let's say that you wanted to follow people eating a plant-based diet. I mean, just if you narrowed it down to that, you've got so many different variations on the plant-based diet, how do you ever organize people into cohorts, and then we all know there's difficulty with self-reported data. Um, and I don't know how we solve those problems. People that are a lot smarter than me are going to have to figure that out. But I think at least the discussion is starting about how ridiculous it is to start looking for a single nutrient or a single food that's going to solve our problems. It really lies in the whole dietary pattern, which is what we teach here at Wellness Forum Health. All right, that's all for today. All for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you next Tuesday with more news.